The Galileos 11 and 12, they are European set, uh, navigation satellites. Europe takes its next step in constructing its own navigation satellite constellation. Today, Thursday, December 17, 2015, with the launch of the 11th and 12th Galileo satellites. Galileo 11 and 12 are, were due for launch atop a Soyuz rocket at 11.51 Greenwich Mean Time, that is 12.51 Central European Time and 8.51 Local Time in French Guiana because it was launched atop a Soyuz rocket from French Guiana. Here the first three stages of the launcher are put together horizontally. The four boosters, each with its own engine, were fixed around the core second stage. The third stage was then integrated on top of that. All these stages of the Soyuz come to French Guiana by ship from St. Petersburg. The two Galileo satellites arrived at the space base by plane. They were then transferred to the space center where they underwent a series of tests to confirm that all their systems were functioning normally. Once these tests were carried out, their fuel tanks were filled. The two satellites were then fixed symmetrically, one after another, on their dispenser. The frigate upper stage was filled in the new frigate fueling facility. It then moved to the S3B satellite building, where the Galileo 11 and 12 satellites were integrated onto it. The fairing then covered this upper composite. On D-4 days, after another series of tests, the launcher left the MiG building. It was rolled out horizontally to its place on the launch pad and then raised vertically. A gantry lets technicians work on all the different stages of the vehicle during its preparation. It keeps Soyuz protected until one hour before liftoff. The upper composite with its passengers was in its turn transferred to the launch zone, raised vertically and integrated onto Soyuz. All her electrical and fluid connections were then checked. Over 100 Russian and European engineers and technicians are working inside the Soyuz Launch Operations Building. The building stands three kilometers from the launch pad. These teams are managed by the COEL, or the Launch Operations Manager, today Jean-Claude Garot of Ariane Space. The Russian team is led by Alexandre Sharavan, the Russian Launch Operations Manager. The launcher technical authority, Mark Grozaich, oversees the vehicle's readiness for flight. His Russian counterpart today is Andrei Mezhevikin. Here in the Soyuz Launch Operations Building, the working languages are French, Russian, and English. Two quality managers for the launch campaign assure launch production quality. Ariane Space follows all operations from Moscow. Another team here in French Guiana is made up of people who interpret and transmit all telemetry data coming from the launcher to the ground stations. At the Soyuz Launch Center, Antoine Courtois heads up the immediate visual control center where telemetry is received. These people look at all data from speed and propulsion to stage separation. All these players are ready for launch of the 13th Soyuz. All right, back with more Joshua Jampo with Sylvain Lodo. I got your name right this time. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Ground, se ground segment manager for Galileo. Glad to have you here. Yes, welcome also to everybody listening, in particular in the operational sites, and I'm thinking about Toulouse in particular, this case at STEC, and also to the ESA Council meeting in Paris today. All right, the, uh, we had the Kletchna start, which came at minus five. Uh, minutes and nine seconds. That's the hand-driven uh, key opening the start to the final sequence that's done up at the launch uh, center. We're going to go to our first film now, a presentation of the mission. Let's have a look on the launcher, which is composed of two parts. The first part is the Soyuz STB, composed of three stages. The second part is the nose module, composed of the frigate stage and the two satellites. During nine minutes, 
the Soyuz STB ascent phase will take place. After that, the nose module will be injected into a suborbital orbit. After that, the Fregat stage will manage a first boost of 13 minutes to inject the nose module into an intermediate orbit. Then, during three hours, a long ballistic phase will take place. After that, the Fregat stage will manage a second burn of four minutes in order to put the nose module into the separation orbit. At last, three hours and 48 minutes after the liftoff, the simultaneous separations of the two spacecraft will occur. We are focusing on the launcher during this initial part of the broadcast. We'll have plenty of time to turn to the satellites once Soyuz has left the pad, and we'll get uh, Sylvan's expert commentary on not only the ground stations, but on everything uh, in the system, right? I hope so, yes. <laughs> All right. At minus uh, 2 minutes and 35 seconds, Seconds, you'll hear the DDO call out that the electrical umbilicals on the satellites have been released. That's the next milestone to watch for. That's separation chow connector. Is that right? Is that what that is? Yes, Dave, that's correct. Yes. And then that's the. Uh, we won't really see it, but we'll we'll hear him say that the release of the umbilicals. And then you'll hear the DDO call out many more milestones. Uh, the the re, uh, release of the masts which comes at, what, minus 20 seconds, I think? It's very exciting to, 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 to see one by one the peeling oh, of the onion, things fall away until, uh, until liftoff. This man is the DDO. A tous DDO, attention, largage des umbilicaux chao. Those are the umbilicals that we were talking about. The DDO is the range operation manager. All the reports from all the systems across the space, which is 700 square kilometers, <clears throat> and includes everything we need to prepare, launch, and follow. So, so as all the information comes into him, and he relays it to us. Two minutes to go. About an hour ago, the gantry was moved back about 80, 80 meters, revealing the launch vehicle, which you can see there. Some other launcher preparations that have already taken place. Yeah, it's at minus uh, three, three hours and, th and 30 minutes. Uh, we fill the tanks with hydrogen peroxide, and this took 20 minutes. Then at minus three minutes, ten, three hours, ten minutes, sorry, we filled the tanks with liquid oxygen. Yes, this time, yes. And at minus two hours, 55, we fill it with kerosene. So all there's three different fuels that are used on the first three stages Correct. Yeah. of Soyuz. There's liquid oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, and kerosene. The upper stage, the fourth stage, of course, is cryogenic fuel. The people in the hall here, as we approach one minute, you'll hear the DDO call out one minute. People in the hall going out to the balconies to watch the liftoff. A tous de DDO, attention pour H0 moins une minute. Top, H0 moins une minute. Or we're into the final 60 seconds. We just want to mention the launch, the ignition, sequence. The ignition sequence is in three stages. From minus 17 seconds, seconds, the engines are tested automatically. Yeah, and at minus 15 seconds is uh, the first control ignition at about 20% of the total thrust. And then there's a second uh, minus seven seconds, the intermediate at pressure check. The video, there you see the, the arms falling away. That's, an, that's always an exciting thing for me to see the arms fall away. And then at minus three seconds, the order is given for the third and final phase, full throttle. The DDO is going to call up. The final countdown will be back after Soyuz has cleared the tower. Enjoy the liftoff, everybody.
once again from French Guiana, beginning her 13th mission from the spaceport. Sylvain, what went through your mind as you watched uh, oh, it's, stuff? It's very thrilling, as always. <laughs> it's a very nice, uh, very nice thing to see. Quite impressive. No matter how many times you see it, yeah, it's always the same thing. Yes. Beautiful. 300 tons at liftoff. <clears throat> roaring through the sky, that's less than half the mass of Ariane 5, you recall. Those of you familiar with the Ariane 5 launches, excuse me, saw Soyuz rise a lot more quickly. The boosters and the central core, or the second stage, are burning now. The boosters? Yeah, the boosters, they, they weigh um, 45 tons each at liftoff. Total mass is, uh, of the first stage is 178 tons. So the engines run on liquid oxygen and kerosene, as we said, yeah. The same propellants which are used for each of the, the three lower stages. The second, or the core stage, is similar to the boosters. Its ignition occurred on the pad, as you saw. This stage will burn for about four minutes. We're coming up on separation of the boosters in just about 10 seconds. And then you'll see, remember, Soyuz lifted off. The DDA was saying everything is nominal, normal on board. We're going to see separation of the boosters in just a minute on the simulation there. There it is, right, right on time. Now, remember, Soyuz weighed 300 tons at liftoff. After separation of the boosters, there's the onboard camera showing them falling away into the ocean. She's down now to ha how much? What does she weigh now after the booster? Uh, less than half its weight. Eh? Less than half, yeah. yeah, I think it's 135 tons, roughly. Yeah, something like that, yes. <laughs> All right, Soyuz remembers complementary, not a competitor, to Ariane 5. She's lifting two satellites, total payload weighing about a ton and a half uh, mm. this morning, while Ariane 5 can lift, of course, 10 tons. Uh, all, there, there's, there are many differences, though. The boosters are the first stage. That's one of the differences. Yes, <coughs> Coming up to the jettison of the fairing, that's in just under a minute. And you'll see Patrick Loire, head of Ariane Space uh, Facilities here in Kourou, giving us a thumbs up, because all is going well with Soyuz. She uh, departed right on time. Soyuz you know, is, uh, goes back to the first days of the space race. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. She was, uh, she goes back to 1966, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, the workhorse of the Soviet program. Yeah. It continues working. Very well indeed. Yeah, it's very reliable, efficient, flexible. And cost-effective. Also, yes, yeah. I believe, yeah. <laughs> and uh, which makes uh, Soyuz good for any kind of mission. I think Soyuz has done every mission possible from telecoms to Earth observation. Yeah. Right? Weather probes. Weather probes, yeah, science probes. Mars missions. She yeah. takes people to the people, ISS, exactly, the space yes. station. Yeah. There's the fairing jettison. You can see leaving exposed to the elements, the two satellites. Those are the black boxes on the end. Now, why can we, we can get rid of the fairing now? Because we don't need it anymore, right? Yeah, because now we are getting out of the, the dense layers of the atmosphere. So we are above 100 kilometers. Yeah, you see we are 124 kilometers at that moment. That's right. On the bottom, uh, Sylvan referring to on the bottom altitude the left, on the bottom, on the bottom left, A on the bottom right are speeds. Are yeah. Good? And at this altitude, you have, no, no, you have neither friction nor heating. So we discard any dead weight, in fact, uh, to, to, make, uh, to maximize the launch, uh, the launch capabilities. Help us go faster? Not necessarily, no? Well, you have less weight, so it's a bit more efficient, yes. We, we don't need any way protection any longer, so we can remove it. All right, T tell us about our trajectory now. We're, we're, we're flying north now, and we're going to go over the Azores, I think? Yeah, at the point in time, we'll fly, yes, close to Azores, yes, yeah. going to over Europe. And then we turn east, that's right, and we go over yeah. Europe. And uh, then we will fly down over Russia and... Over Australia, I think. Yes, the South, the South Indian, Indian Ocean, Ocean, close to Australia, yes. You saw the second stage separated and the third stage ignited there. One particularity of the Soyuz vehicle is whereas with Arian, we separate the lower stage before igniting the upper stage. Soyuz, it's just the opposite. The third stage is ignited two seconds before separation of the second stage. Now, the lower part of the third stage, called the skirt, is used to channel the flux of this third stage motor ignition down toward the stage below where it rebounds, which gives an added thrust, 
assisting separation. Is that is that right? That's correct. Yes. And I think yes. you saw the parts of the skirt being exactly being yeah. being blown away there. Being blown away, yes. And during those um, ten seconds, in fact, Soyuz climbs four kilometers, so from roughly 149 to 150. Three kilometers in those four seconds. Good. Yeah. Giuliano Gatti will be hearing from him a little later on, telling us about the uh, low Earth orbit uh, operations, the first operations after separation. Shortly, we will be picked up by one of our first ground uh, tracking stations, not on the ground actually, but in the ocean. In the ocean, yes. This is uh, yeah the first one to pick it up after the one from uh, Galio, uh, the Galio one here in Kourou. There is a station here on the hill behind us, and this um, this station called SNA is, is is a boat that's in the middle of the of the Atlantic. Yes, in the Atlantic, yes. And that's only used for for Soyuz. It's not used for Ariane or or Vega because normally they don't. Fly yes, that. they don't fit in the same way. Yes. All right, the series of ground stations, which is your pursuit, follows the launcher all during its flight and picks up all the radar and telemetry. We'll be hearing more later. For now, we can go to a launch replay, the first of what we hope is going to be many replays, and you can relive those exciting moments just under seven minutes ago as uh, Soyuz first left the pad. Well, maybe not. We're supposed to have a, a replay, but uh, the, the, the ground stations, you, you can see them there. SNA is the boat. Azor, San Maria Station. Osagel is where? Close to Toulouse. Yeah. In French. So, in by, France, yes. so at that point, uh, Soyuz is already heading east yes. over Europe. So, so she flies from Gallio over the, the boat, which is SNA, mm -hmm. north, and then makes, and then north over the Azores. Yes, correct. And then makes her trip starting to go east. And the satellites will be separated <laughs> over <laughs> Australia, you say? Yeah, close to Australia. It's in uh, over the Indian Ocean, but uh, it will be the last station to, to follow it is uh, for the launcher is from Perth in Australia. Right. Okay. And that station's used in a lot of um, a lot of tracking for a lot of. Uh, yes, these kind of stations are used for many missions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're tracking stations for this purpose. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's an international uh, cooperation because these stations work for NASA. They work for Arian Space. Well, in, yeah. but in, in this case, we are talking about a station which is tracking. Um, uh, so use for sure. Then when we we talk about the the launch and early uh, orbit phases, what uh, they will be doing from Toulouse this time. Um, in fact, they use a network of stations which are in fact uh, located uh, around the world, and they will use then other stations to to track those satellites. So 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 we can say that it's an international cooperation effort. Uh, ah yes, for this kind of uh, programs, you are constantly using uh, worldwide networks. And uh, you effectively share this, uh, this, uh, this infrastructure for many missions. Okay, our altitude 180 kilometers, our speed over 6.2 kilometers per second. What is ESA's role in the uh, Galileo program? In Galileo, so ESA is, um, in fact, the architect of the system. To the make it simple. Which means? Well, we, de we have designed the system, we right. are developing it, and we are deploying it right now. Right. So and we are in fact in charge of uh, making it work. Yeah. In, okay. Simply. Yeah. So the origin of Galileo is with the European Space Agency. Well, ESA has played a big role. Uh, now we need also to um, to talk about the European Commission, who is in fact the program uh, the program in charge of the program now. And they're here tonight. Yeah, okay. of course they are here very uh, and indeed, and they are in fact, uh, for instance, they are now uh, financing the whole program. And uh, they are of course the political uh, lead. Okay. There, is, uh, there, there are three main bodies involved in Galileo. There's ESA, and there's, you said, the European Commission, and there is also uh, an agency. We should talk about the, yes, the, the GSA, which is the, the, the European GNSS Agency. The European? The GNSS, so for Global Navigation Satellite Service that's Agency. Global, yeah. That's right. Global, say and that again, are. say that again, the Global. The, the global Navig navigation Glo satellite system yes, from Europe. Okay, here's your replay. A little late, but better late than never. So he is rising right off the pad, trailing all that fire. We'll have more replays for you uh, later on because we have other cameras at other outposts. You were talking about the GSA. GSA yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And uh, the GSA was uh, created to to implement to implement the services for Galileo. Mm -hmm. So they are in charge, of, for instance, of uh, maximizing the use of the of the Galileo signals. It's another replay there, as promised. Can we talk about the stations now? The network of stations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So we could talk. Uh, so if we, there are several network of stations. So we talk about the ones uh, related to the launch uh, no. um, uh, follow-up, and there are also the stations which will be used for the, the Leo. Information tardive de la séparation du bloc qui et de l'allumage frégate. So we just had the first scheduled yeah. first uh, ignition of the upper stage, the frigate stage. Now this burn will last about 13 minutes. There will be a second burn, which will take place in about three hours and a quarter. The last about four minutes, but we'll get to that. Uh, <clears throat> we'll get to that a bit later. If you just joined us, the first three stages on the Soyuz have done their work. Only the frigate upper stage is burning now. You started to talk about the stations, but maybe you want to tell us more about frigate. Yeah, so Fregat, it's, a, it's an autonomous, flexible upper stage, and uh, it's a relatively recent addition. Uh, it was qualified uh, around 2000, and it has been designed yeah. to operate as a no-biter, in fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now this is so, so this version of the Soyuz is, is an updated version of the one we were talking about before that goes back to the first days of the space race. Yes. It's, it's the same basic system, but the frigate was uh, not part of the original Soyuz. No, correct. This is much more recent. Right, okay. Yes, 15 years ago, yeah. So if the first three stages of Soyuz, tell me if this is right, first first three stages are basically Russian, then the top stage, the Fregat, which is what we're looking at now, is a European stage. Is that... No, Fregat is also Russian. Fregat is also Russian? Yes. Okay, produced by NPO Lovochkin. Mm -hmm. Correct. And mass at liftoff of about six tons. All right, why don't we... Um, Acquisition de la TV. Didio is... Going to call it. You might have noticed a slight de delay. The function nominalement et acquisition de la T mesure lanceur par la station de Santa Maria des Açores. Okay, we're going to go to our first film on Galileo. We'll be hearing, I believe, from Didier Favre again. Cool, French Guiana. At the European Spaceport, two more Galileo satellites have been prepared in the clean room dedicated to the Galileo program. These facilities are no luxury, as ESA and the Galileo program have had a very busy year, with a massive output and a good pace to keep up. But all the hard work was definitely worth the effort. 2015 is a great year for Galileo. A launch in March, a launch in September, a third launch in December, six satellite launch in nine months. The uh, Galileo deployment is now going full speed ahead. And next year we'll have uh, complete, not a completion, but a sufficient number of satellites to um, achieve tests at uh, high level. So it's very good for the program since it's launched today. What is also very good for the program is that in the course of only one year, the number of Galileo satellites in orbit has doubled. And now one third of the constellation is up and running, with the ground segment also deployed worldwide. And the program is on track. Once Galileo 12 have been fully checked and are operational in orbit, first services should start by the end of 2016. Now, after the successful in-orbit validation phase of the system, ESA is taking full advantage of a return of experience based on several years of operations. 2015 also marks the historic milestone of the 10th anniversary of the launch of the GOVA satellite on the 28th of December 2005. GOV stands for Galileo in Orbit Validation Element. It was the first test satellite for the Galileo program, proving the quality of the first navigation payload built in Europe. And since then, ESA and Europe have come a long way. Uh, in the last 10 years, we have had uh, six operational launches, plus two GOV, eight launches, 14 satellite launches, a ground segment deployed all over the world, an excellent performance demonstrated in March 13 with the first positioning, EGNOS now operational and ready to augment Galileo on top of what uh, EGNOS does already with GPS. So 10 years demonstrating that Europe joins the club of the powers mastering navigation. Things are going well. Galileo and EGNOS are perfect examples of Europe's expertise in the technology field. With Galileo providing users worldwide with publicly owned high quality satellite navigation and a timing platform, and EGNOS now being implemented in air traffic management for civil aviation. 
ESA and the European Commission must now prepare for the provision of Galileo services for the citizens in Europe and beyond. Ten years after the launch of the first satellite, Galileo is a reality, and Europe has its autonomy in satellite navigation. That's a point we keep coming back to, this autonomy uh, provided by Galileo. You may have noticed that since the start of the mission, there's DJ again, since the mission, uh, events announced by the DDO come in with a slight delay. Now, this is quite normal. The reason being that all the information we mentioned, the telemetry and the radar coming into the ground stations, they're sent from them here to Jupiter, but they have to go to Moscow first, Yes, right? correct. They have to be confirmed, to be confirmed there, yeah. by Moscow. Then they come into French Guiana, where they go to a place called the CVI, the Immediate uh, Visual Control Center. We'll, we'll be, uh, we looked at that during the film on the uh, launcher campaign. Yep. Uh, from the CVI here, then they're relayed to the DDO here. So it takes it can take uh, yes, more than a few seconds. More than a few seconds, yes, you're right. Okay, just so uh, you're aware of that. Where are we? I want to know about your job. Your ground segment manager for 11 years you've been doing it. Yes, what do you do exactly? For 11 years. Well, in fact, I've been following the, the full cycle of development uh, for the ground control segment and for the, the ground mission segment in particular. So even before, well, well obviously, before the first uh, satellite went up, you were there uh, I, of working course, on the ground yes, station. To build that, and then it was uh, ready for to support um, the satellites that we launched uh, uh, initially, yes. So, so how, how long before the first satellite launch do you have to be uh, starting to prepare the ground segment? In our case, okay, we started development in 2005, and the first uh, satellites were launched in 2011. So, so this was, six years. Yeah, it's a long development uh, cycle, for sure. And that, that's for the entire ground system? Uh, yes, for what uh, for the control segment and the mission segment. But then, uh, still today, we are implementing important upgrades because we are we we need now to make the system uh, more reliable. All right, we're going to talk about those upgrades in just a moment. But for now, we're going to another film on Galileo, how it's going to be used, and we'll be hearing from the people at this global satellite agency that you talked about. <laughs> Since its certification for civil aviation in 2011, EGNOS, the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay Service, has gone from strength to strength. EGNOS is a satellite-based augmentation system that improves GNSS positioning using three satellites and a network of more than 39 reference stations in 24 countries, providing much greater accuracy than achieved through GPS alone. Recently, EGNOS added a new service, LPV-200. Pilots rely on instruments for most of their approach. However, in the final stages of the landing procedure, they have to decide whether it's safe to land based on what they can see. The additional accuracy of the EGNOS LPV-200 service lowers the altitude at which the pilot has to make that decision to only 200 feet above the runway. The um, decision height's important because that allows more accessibility to airports in poorer weather conditions. So essentially the lower the decision height, the better access that airport's going to have in poorer weather conditions. EGNOS reduces risks associated with landing in bad weather, increases accessibility to airports, reduces delays, diversions and cancellations by increasing airspace capacity and lowering both air traffic control and pilot workload EGNOS improves safety and increases efficiency of operations whilst lowering fuel consumption, CO2 emissions and noise levels. The service requires no upgrade to an airport's ground infrastructure or to existing certified EGNOS receivers and offers the same decision height as ILS Cat 1. Well, we started off with the, the basic LNAV approach and that minimum was, it was 500 feet and LPV using EGNOS brings it down to 250 to 300 feet here. When we get LPV 200 that will come down to 200 feet so the aircraft can be a lot lower before it has to initiate a missed approach. LPV 200 will mean it's um, near enough identical to our Cat 1 ILS 
The European GNSS agency has worked continuously with aircraft manufacturers, airspace users, aviation authorities and airports to help integrate and adopt EGNOS. Every aviation uh, GPS receiver we sell today includes uh, EGNOS um, as part of its chipset. And in fact, I don't think we've sold a receiver for the last seven years that didn't include um, EGNOS capability. As of October 2015, 271 EGNOS-based procedures in 157 airports had been developed, and every month more airports are adopting EGNOS. I think there's a great future for this system because uh, it will uh, permit many airlines to operate in, in many airports that now don't have the proper facilities. Most navigation systems in aircraft and helicopters can now use EGNOS, including the new ATR600 series and the Airbus 350XWB, both of which offer EGNOS-enabled avionics. Furthermore, EGNOS is still improving. EGNOS version 3, which will integrate Galileo, is under development. And EGNOS will be extended across and possibly beyond Europe. Thanks to the LPV-200 service today and the future evolution of EGNOS, European aviation will become ever safer and increasingly efficient. Okay, so you see that it seems that all is proceeding nominally on board. You can see that we are now uh, at an altitude of uh, 383 kilometers and still, of course, uh, increasing it very fast now. Um, and while you, you were watching that film, uh, in fact, we've picked up uh, our downrange tracking station in Osagel. That's the one in France. Yes. All right, now we're talking about the ground segment, we're talking about the space segment. Space segment, I assume, is the satellite. Yes, right? exactly, it's the satellites. Right. So we are, in fact, to, uh, to deploy, as was said by Didier, uh, yeah. up to 30 satellites. Right, uh, that includes six spares. Yes, in fact, the nominal constellation is 24 satellites, eight uh, on uh, three planes, uh, but we are also having two uh, on, um, in orbit uh, spares to, to ensure a good availability of the, of the system. Now you say different planes, these are different orbital planes. Yes, exactly, we have three planes. In fact, there are, these planes are the uh, orbital, uh, the orbits we are, we are flying, and they are separated from um, one another by 120 degrees. All right, we have had extinction of the first frigate burn, the scheduled extinction. We're waiting for confirmation to come uh, from the DDO, but as we mentioned, that takes a while. So now we're into the what we call the ballistics phase. The first burn is over. So yeah. we're, go we're, we're, we're starting our long coast. We're going to be coasting for about three and a quarter hours. Yes, correct. It's now, yeah. now, why do we have to do that? Tous les systèmes bord fonctionnent nominalement. Le, les paramètres à bord sont conformes à l'attendu. DDO says everything continues to function normally on board. Why, why do we have to coast for so long now? Yeah, because now we have to reach um, the... The, uh, in the orbit, the moment where we want to circularize uh, our orbit. Circularize, meaning? To make, uh, today we are on a kind of elliptic uh, uh, orbit, and then we will have to make it a circle around the, the Earth, because this is what is the orbit uh, for Galileo satellites. Ah, okay. So, so that's what we need, the ballistics phase. For. Yes. Because this, this, is, this is called the ballistics phase, or sometimes they call it a space ballet. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, because they're... So what's happening now? We're, we're coasting, but uh, are we are we turning in, in any direction or what? No, no, no we are effectively uh, coasting. We will do, uh, in fact, uh, because uh, at this level there is, in terms of uh, environment, uh, you have uh, important differences in temperature uh, from different sides uh, of the of the spacecraft. Yeah. So it can be now, now we have the confirmation yes. of the frigate cutoff, which was scheduled for plus 2332. So you see about a minute ago, so, so, so we're taking from Moscow to here, takes about a minute. Yes. Okay, everything is okay. Our next film is on the European Commission. We'll be back with more. Galileo, the state-of-the-art European system of orbiting satellites and ground stations that will provide positioning, navigation and timing anywhere on the globe. 
It is the joint effort of some 5,000 people in various European organizations. In the late 90s, visionary European politicians understood the strategic importance for Europe to have its own satellite navigation system. La décision prise aujourd'hui par le Conseil est une décision clé pour aboutir dans l'un des projets technologiques les plus ambitieux, ou pour ne pas dire le projet technologique le plus ambitieux au niveau européen. Since then, European Union countries have worked together to design and build the system. It was the European Parliament and the Council that asked the European Commission to manage Galileo's development. My strategy is also very simple, built on what we have achieved. I will focus work, work in three areas, deploying the infrastructure, providing services as they come on stream, and establishing Galileo in the market. Soon, anyone around the globe will be able to use the Galileo signals, free of charge, to find their position with unprecedented accuracy. And thanks to an agreement signed between the European Union and the United States of America, Galileo will work seamlessly with GPS. When lives are at risk, Galileo will also aid search and rescue operations by accurately locating emergency distress beacons. Galileo will also provide secure navigation tools for European Union governments. This public regulated service can be used for example by the Coast Guard or the police. In building Galileo, European industries have demonstrated their know-how and excellence in satellite navigation technologies. Over the next few years, as Galileo's capabilities grow, that excellence will be there for all to use, and by 2020, Galileo will be fully operational and provide continuous navigation services worldwide. And to keep Europe ready for the future, work has already started on the next generation Galileo system, which will provide more features and even better accuracy. Work has already started on the second generation is how the film ends. So tell us about the second generation. Where are we going? What can, what can we expect to see? Uh, yes, at ESA we have been uh, carrying out a, a lot of studies um, since several years now to address key topics uh, for, for these evolutions. Uh, for instance, uh, we could talk about uh, increasing the, the power which is available on board, which is always a limiting factor, so it's something that we are looking at for sure. How, how much more power do you need? Well, it's, uh, you know, um, the more power you have, the more flexible you can be for uh, maybe also applications which are not... Uh, uh, identify completely today. So the power is effectively an important driver. But we could have other aspects like what we call uh, electric propulsion, which would be other ways to, uh, to get to our orbit, uh, or inter-satellite links, for instance, to have another architecture for our, for our um, overall system. Okay, we're looking at the gentleman from OHB. OHB are the prime contractors for the satellites, and our next film will tell you all about OHB. Galileo FOC, satellites by OHB. OHB headquarters Bremen, inside the Galileo clean room on Island 1, where the mechanical integration of the Galileo FOC satellite starts. The last satellite, Flight Model 22, has finished the first part of the mechanical integration and is now ready for the transfer to Island 2 for the first electrical tests. OHP colleagues in AIT are preparing the so-called marriage of flight model 18, which means payload meets platform. The modular and flexible design by OHP allows great flexibility in AIT, as well as at the same time it complies with ESA's high quality standards. OHB's head of mechanical AIT for Galileo, Matthias Tausche, is responsible for all 22 satellites. We have here in Bremen uh, seven islands. Uh, we have a mixture of mechanical and test islands. So we start with mechanical islands, go over to test islands until we reach our configuration here, what we want to reach in Bremen. And uh, every six weeks we finalize one uh, satellite. Inside OHB's other clean room, the Galileo satellites are tested on system level before their shipment to Aztec and Nordwijk, where they undergo the environmental tests. 
By now, all FOC satellites, which have already been launched, show an excellent in-orbit performance. Parallel to the successful delivery of our FOC fleet, OHB is already actively working on the development of the next generation navigation satellites. Find out more about OHB as a leading space systems company in Europe on OHB.de. Galileo FOC Satellites by OHB He mentioned uh, twice in that film, FOC, what is that, it's fully something something? It's full operational capability. Full operational capability. Okay, now is that, that's not new. No, but this is what we want to achieve by 2020. So this is a very important goal for the program. Okay, now the, the program is under civil control, but the signal can be used by others, right? Fire brigades yeah, and we, police? Yeah, we're having an, uh, the open service to be used by, um, you know, by uh, anybody for mass market applications, for instance. You have a commercial service for providing additional uh, added value in some applications, for instance, increased uh, accuracy. And we have uh, what is called a public uh, regulated service, and this is for, with a controlled access for the governments. For, for, for governments. Okay, I think we're going to go to one last replay. Before Here's your last replay. Before we temporarily leave you because as we mentioned this ballistics phase is going to last about three and a quarter hours we won't keep you we'll take a break and be back with you later uh you can stay connected uh, uh yes i think via the internet uh, for sure yeah and, uh, and we will be back um, with the end of the mission at 12 25 local right 12 25 local crew time or three hour plus three hours 35 minutes into the mission here in Kuru. Meanwhile, the VIPs are going to be visiting the different launch sites. I think, and I think you're going with them, aren't you? Yeah, we will show them the Galileo station we are having in uh, in Kuru. Yeah. All right, so everybody will be back here for the second part of the broadcast, which will last about an hour. You'll see separation of the two passengers. Uh, so we'll be back at twelve twenty-five local. Enjoy the break, and we'll see you then. The launch of the European Navigation Satellites Galileo 11 and 12, both combined, both both of them in the same in the same uh, spaceship, launched well about one half of an hour ago. Um, broadcasted live here on SciTech Talk, Internet, Radio and YouTube Live Television. The Galileos 11 and 12, they are European set, uh, navigation satellites. Europe takes its next step in constructing its own navigation satellite constellation. Today, Thursday, December 17th 2015 with the launch of the 11th and 12th Galileo satellites Galileo 11 and 12 are were due for launch atop a Soyuz rocket at 11:51 Greenwich Mean Time that is 12:51 Central European Time and 8.51 local time in French Guiana because it was launched atop a Soyuz rocket from French Guiana. <laughs> 